This is another text that I've come across where there was a lot more there than I thought I would get. Like I said about our text that we've been going through in Romans, you open the door and you get an avalanche of truth, so to speak. You put your hook in the sea and you catch a whale. This is the kind of passage that I'm dealing with. And it's a very joyful one to look at indeed. Looking back at that transition you made when you came into Christ, that initial coming in, once lost, now found. Now the text, the shepherd says, Rejoice with me, for I have found that sheep which was lost. Luke 15, 6. And the shepherds rejoiced, and he found a sheep that had wandered away. And But he was able to bring it back yeah. safely, safe and sound, without harm. Likewise, you were once lost, but you've been found. Now, to give some background on the passage, as you may recall at the very beginning, first two verses are the only words in the whole chapter that are not the words of Jesus. And it says that publicans and sinners came around Jesus to hear him speak. Well, they wanted to hear what Jesus had to talk about. They were really excited about this. Pharisees saw this, scoffing, murmuring. This man receives sinners and Even worse, he eats with them. (laughs) And this whole chapter, Luke 15, is Jesus' response to their murmuring. He brings up a shepherd that had lost a sheep. He brings up a woman that had lost a coin. A son that had forsaken his father and went into the world. And And then he speaks about those things being recovered. He's showing the absurdity of the Pharisee's position. Something great had happened here. They're not supposed to be murmuring. They should have been rejoicing. They had overlooked the great work that God had done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Men may not think of much of what has happened to you in Christ Jesus, but trust me, the heavens are not the same way. There's rejoicing in heaven. Likewise, you were lost, but now in Christ, you have been found. He has brought you back. Something to make note of is the fact that when we come into Christ, you make a transition. It's not like things just go on the way they were. First you were here, now you're here. You're looking that way. Then you're going this way. You were this, now you're this. You loved that. Now you love this. There's a transition made. The scriptures are no means vague on this. Uh, John eleven twenty five. Jesus said, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. That's a transition. Just like in our main text here. Uh, Ephesians 2, 1, he said, You hath he quickened who are dead in trespasses and sins. That's a transition. Another transition, Ephesians 5, 8. For you were sometimes darkness, but now you are light in the Lord. Now walk as children of light. Amen. Another one, uh, 1 Thessalonians 1, 10. And to wait for his son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Another transition. And also, when the prodigal son returned home, this is what his father said of him. It was meet that we should make merry and be glad for this thy brother was, de- was dead. And is alive again, was lost, now is found. Transition. In order for men to be saved, they have to be changed from their former state. No one who's lost is going to get into the kingdom of God. Let's be clear about that. So the logical conclusion is, if you're going to get into that kingdom, you have to be found. And I do feel the modern church has really dropped the ball on this topic. They, They speak to believers as if nothing happened. You're no different than anyone else. They quote Romans 3.23. They quote John 8.10. They quote 1 John 1, 8 through 10. He's without sin cast the first stone. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Anyone says he's without sin, he's a liar. You're no different. Is that what those texts mean? I assure you that is not what they mean. Regardless of what men say about believers, God spoke spoken clearly on this matter. Amen. The fact of the matter is, if you're no different than you were before, then you're not found. You're lost. Don't let anyone tell you that you've remained the same after Jesus found you. No one will rob you of this truth. Now, when considering how God has provided such a great salvation for men to be found, it tells you a lot about the nature of God. I wanted to speak about this briefly. God giving his son for the sins of the world was his an act of love for humanity, as stated in John 3, 16. God still loved the world. He gave his son. God, had, he loves the human race. He has provided for mankind a way of, to escape wrath and eternal punishment and death. Also, we, we can recall 1 Timothy 2, 4. God will have all men to be saved and come to knowledge of the truth. Oh, God takes delight in this. Other, trans, other versions say he, he desires men to be saved. Amen. 
God, oh, this brings pleasure to the Father. See men saved, coming, turning from their wicked ways. There's some, uh, there's an, you sure you can recall this passage in 2 Peter 3, 9. God is long suffering to us word. Don't omit that word. Us word. Those of us who believe. Not willing that any perish, but that all come to repentance. Oh, how this tells us about the nature of the Father. What I'm showing here is the Lord takes joy in saving men. He surely does desire to do good and show mercy to man. Even though man is lost, God provides salvation for them. And to show this further, God has prepared salvation. He had salvation planned out before man even fell, which even tells you more, the well-being God had toward humanity. In 1 Peter 1, 18-20, it says, For as much as you know, you were not redeemed with corruptible things of silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers, but with the precious blood of Christ as a lamb without blemish and without spot, who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world, but was now manifest in these last times for you. God was by no means ignorant of what would happen to men. He did. This wasn't a surprise to God that men became the way that he was. He knew man would not stand very long on his own. He knew the human race would become lost, so before any sins are committed, he foreordains Christ to be sacrificed, sacrificed for the world's sin at a set time. This shows how merciful the Father really is. He has prepared a means for men to be saved before they technically needed saving. This is truly something to think about. You being found was by no means an accident. It was part of God's purpose from the beginning to save you and draw you to his son. 2 Timothy 1.9 He who saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ before the world began. So obviously this isn't like recovering lost like in maybe you think in the normal sense of the word, like someone's walking around like, oh, hey, look, someone's lost. I found something. This isn't what, this isn't the case. God was not ignorant of the, of the condition of man. Rather, in this case, from being lost to being found requires more like recovering or rescuing something that was fallen. It would fit more with this kind of a context. Christ is said to save the lost. Let's be clear, this is something Jesus does. He finds those who are lost. No man can come to, who comes to Christ is led away from God or overcome by sin. This is what Jesus said he did while on the earth. Roman, or I'm sorry, Matthew 18, 11 says, For the Son of Man is come to save that which was lost. You notice he didn't say, you save, you seek and save. He says, I seek and save the lost. And he also says in Luke 9, 56, The Son of Man has not come to destroy men's lives, but to save them. This is what Jesus does. Amen. This is what he's doing even now. He's saving the lost, delivering them from the upcoming wrath of God, which will be poured out on all transgressors. I want to remind you of this. When you're found, you couldn't take credit for it, in other words. Jesus did the saving here. You didn't, like, just stumble upon God. You didn't stumble upon salvation, walking around, minding your own business. Jesus did it. Jesus found you. Jesus came and he pulled you out of the fire. So therefore, no one, you, well, you'd be in a lost and hopeless state if it was just you on your own. You, because that's what mankind does on his own. He gets worse and worse and worse and more lost and more dead and more defiled and more wicked and more evil. That's what man does when he's without Christ. But that stops when Jesus found you. You have no need to fear now when you are found. There's cause for rejoicing and gladness. And the Lord has truly been merciful to us. Now I want to present to you that we're speak, uh, a thought here that we're speaking from a higher view, seeing that we are the ones who have been found, I feel appropriate to mention this briefly. There's, there's a scripture that speaks about finding God in Jeremiah. I'm going to read that real quick. Jeremiah 29, 13 to 14. And ye shall seek me and find me. That's what God said. You will find me. When you shall search me with your, all your heart, and I will be found of you saith the Lord, and I will turn away your captivity, and I will gather you from all the nations, and from all places whither I have driven you, saith the Lord, and I will bring you again into a place whence I cause you to be carried away captive. Now in the sense, there is a sense in which we found the Lord. There is a sense that's true. When we were seeking the truth, we came to Christ. Some of us have heard people who claim that they, they found God, they found the Lord, they found Jesus, they found the truth. Like they've discovered it. And there's a sense of truth to this. I don't by no means condemn such an expression. But this main text, it describes you as being found. 
Luke 15, a sh- the sheep, the coin, the prodigal son, and no doubt refer to those who were lost, us. But yet, here's the peculiar thing. The people, that ca- it's, he's referring to people who came to him. Did you notice that? At the very beginning, it says, Paul Book of the Sinners came to Jesus to hear him speak, but now he's telling a parable about them being found. When the circumstances would look like, they found him. Well, then that raises the question, why did you come to Jesus? Mm-hmm. Something drew you. That's right. Amen. And so maybe someone will wonder, well, did I find God or did God find me? Well, I believe both are valid expressions. It's just a matter of the, having the higher view. From a lower view, we found the Lord, we sought him, we, we, we were wanting what he had to offer, and we found what we sought. That's what Jesus said, you seek, you will find. From a higher view, it was God who found us when we were lost, and it was when he found us that resulted in us finding him. God certainly is not sitting on his hands waiting for men to find him. But at the same time, we're not sitting on our hands either. We don't sit on our hands like, well, God will save me. He'll just pick me up and he'll carry me into heaven. No, there's involvement on both sides. It's amazing to be able to see this. He does not exclude our involvement in the process of salvation. Now, at this point, I, want, I think it's important to speak on like, exactly how man became lost. There's a lot of folklore said about this. And I feel it's important to establish how man got into the state that he was in. Why was it lost? Jesus said, I want to seek and save that which was lost. How was it lost? Let's, all, let's just see what the God, Word of God says on this. All speculation, philosophy aside. First thing we want to establish here, get something real straight here. God's not responsible for mankind's sinful state. God did not cause any man to do evil or even tempt them to do wrong. Therefore, he can't be blamed for this creation being corrupted and falling from his favor. James 1.13 says, let no man say when he's tempted, I'm tempted of God. For God cannot be tempted with evil, neither tempted he any man. That's, that's the word of God right there. Not only is he not a tempter of evil, it also says these things. Matthew 22, 32 says, I am the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. He also goes on record saying this, for God's not the author of confusion, but of peace. And God is not unrighteous. To forget your work and labor of love. How could God not be able to tempt any man to do evil, or even be tempted himself to do evil? And on top of that, be the God of the living, the author of peace, not being righteous, and at the same time be responsible for such a wretched state as this state that we're speaking of about man? How could that be possible? It's impossible. Men have blamed God for entrance into the entrance of evil into the world. They're like, well, God made a mistake, and he's cleaning it up with salvation. Well, this isn't true. Maybe you can think of certain terms like my, in my own personal experience, like I lose my wallet, I forgot where I put it. Or like I forget to exchange the fluids in my car, and now the car breaks down. Men view salvation that way. And that is the biggest mistake they can make. God was not negligent. God did not overlook anything. God did not fail to do anything. All the, if they want to point a finger, the finger is pointed at the creation. Man fell by his own transgression. By his own will he fell. And we should rid ourselves of such sloppy, twisted views of God as to blame him for the, for the sinful state of the world. Let's by no means leave it that way. But let's like observe how man became lost. See, let's, like, let's rewind a little bit. Like we're right here talking, Jesus talking to the Pharisees. Let's rewind. Let's go back, way back to the beginning. Genesis chapter 3. Or about Adam and Eve eating the forbidden fruit. How did, like, what happened there? Well, let's observe. In Genesis chapter 3, you know, Jesus, or God told the man and the woman they could eat of any tree in the garden. But don't eat of that tree, the knowledge of good and evil. Just one tree. Just don't eat that tree. And the next thing you know, what a serpent is talking to Eve. And he says, you can't, what, can you eat of all these trees? She said, we can eat of all these trees except for that one. We will surely die if we eat of that tree. So the serpent says, you will not surely die. You'll become as gods. Be able to distinguish good and evil if you eat that tree. And then on top of that, she looks, the woman looks at the tree. It looks good. Oh, it looks delicious. I must have that fruit. She eats it. Nothing seems to happen. Well, hey, let's, I'm going to take it to my husband. He offers it. I've eaten it. Here, have some of this fruit. And so he eats it also. And then when there's all of them doing this, they're ashamed. And just... It just so happens God's walking through the garden when this happens. And so they hide. They hide from him. God calls out, where are you, Adam? 
And Adam says, I hit, here am I, like, why are you hiding? And he's like, well, I'm naked, I hid. This is when, this is when God confronts him. He says, who told you you were naked? Did you eat of that tree I told you not to eat of? And so what's Adam did? He points to the woman. She gave it to me. She did it. So he turns to the woman, like, what have you done? Then she points, the serpent told me to do it. And so God gives a serpent, like, he'll be cursed, he'll scrawl on your, on your belly on the dust of the earth the rest of your days. But he comes back to them. He doesn't overlook them. So he turns to the woman, suffering and childbearing, he addresses Adam. For his disobedience, the earth is cursed for his, for his sake. And what's the result of this? They're driven out of the garden. He kicked them out. You're not welcome here anymore. And he, he points cherubs and a flaming sword at the east part of the garden so they might keep the way of the tree of life. Obviously, the fall is not owing to God's negligence, but man's disobedience and rebellion. This is how sin entered or was introduced into the world. But Adam disobeyed the Lord, and the result of, him, of that was spiritual ruin and death on the, in the human race. The result was the human race dying as, along with him. This is what it says in Romans 5. Verses 12 and 19, therefore, as by one man, by one man sin, or, sin entered into the world, and death by sin, so death passed upon all men, for all have sinned. And later, 19, it says, for what, by one man's disobedience, many were made sinners. Yeah, right. That's the entrance of sin. That's how mankind became lost. Adam was disobedient. How bad did mankind become? We'll see. This is like something that just continually got worse and worse. Mankind did become evil and wicked. In the days of Noah, God looked in the world, and this is what is said concerning what he thought of it. Genesis 6, 5, and 6. God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. And it repented the Lord that he even made man. It grieved him at his heart. This is indeed a grievous text to read, but it does show us how far man had fallen. Man had become so evil that the Lord was sorry he even made them. This particular generation was so detestable to God that God wrote it off completely except for Noah, whom did find favor in his sight. But let's not stop there. God said this concerning the very thoughts of man. Psalm ninety-four, eleven: The Lord knoweth the thought of man and their vanity. The thoughts of man are not on what is spiritual. They are on what is carnal and vile. The temporal and corruptible things dominate their minds. Vanity shows the thought of man that's vain, foolish, wicked, unwise. The Lord obviously is not ignorant of this fact. God said this about the heart. In Jeremiah 17, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? The heart of man is evil and more mortally sick. It is filled with shrewd guile and desires of what is wrong. It only seeks corruption and personal gain. And lastly, Paul recites the words from King David in the Psalms concerning the state of man in Romans chapter 3, 10 through 12. As is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. They are all gone out of the way. They are all together become unprofitable. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. Amen. After reading these various passages, the conclusion is inevitable. The human race is lost. Amen. It's evil and debased, offensive to God. This is what the human race had become. And it has become that way because of its own wrongdoings. Men did not... Men did not know God or seek him. They were more concerned with their own personal interests and motives. What pleased them was more important, and serving God was something they took very little interest in. However, God did not leave man such a wretched and hopeless state. Let's, let's, let's bring that to the surface. Obviously, in order for men to be found, God has to intervene and do something. As you can see, it's only getting worse. No one's going to rise up. No one's going to stand up and say, I'm not going to live this way anymore. I'm going to serve the Lord with all my heart. No one's going to stand up and do that without God doing something. He has to do something here. Men will only become worse on his own. Man simply will not be saved without God's involvement. I did not bring this up only to remind you the state that you were in, but to show you what a great work the Lord has done. For man to be saved from such a state as this is truly remarkable. Now at this point, as they were, we're talking about this transition here. You were lost, but now you're found. Well, what, wh like, what can we see in just those two words, lost, found? Like, what is those? What do those mean? What's involved in both of those things? So let's just like, let's just start with the first one. What's involved in being lost? Like, what's that mean? Let's look into that. To give us more of a understanding of like what state we were in. Obviously, we're speaking of a dangerous state. As you could see throughout the scriptures, this is something God clearly condemns the state that man was in. It's no small thing that you were brought out of this state. The thing to be noted here is that lost is associated with unbelief. 
a very serious thing. The scriptures are clear on the fact that those who do not believe are damned. John 3.18, it speaks that the, he that believeth not is condemned already because he had not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. Condemned right now. This, the, the text does not say he will be condemned, but that he, they are condemned. God spoke of those who did not believe the truth being damned in 2 Thessalonians 2.12. It is like an inmate on death row. The judgment is cast in stone. It's irreversible. All he can do is sit in his cell in shackles until that judgment comes to pass. There's nothing he can do to reverse what, what has happened. Such people have no hope of escape or deliverance. Likewise, those who are unbelieving have no hope of eternal life as long as they remain in that state. That when a person is lost, their end is only destruction. Here's another thing to think of. Being lost is associated with ignorance. Perhaps you've heard the word lost used that way. A person will not know what's going on. They'll say, I'm lost. In the sense that they're confused. They don't understand. Paul, in his second letter to the Thessalonians, wrote of the Lord being revealed in heaven and that in flaming fire, taking vengeance on them that know not God. And not then that owe not obey not the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. Paul also wrote in his letter to the Ephesians, Ephesians 4, 17-18, This I say then, therefore, and testify in the Lord, that ye henceforth not walk as other Gentiles walk, in the vanity of their mind, having their understanding darkened, being alienated from the life of God through the ignorance that is in them because of the blindness of their heart. This shows us what it, another thing of what it means to be lost. It involves ignorance, not knowing not having knowledge of the truth, not being able to comprehend the things of God. Paul even spoke of what he did in times past, and he mentions that he did those things ignorantly in unbelief, because he didn't know. Being lost involves not being aware of the danger that you are in. A person can be in grave danger, they, and they, they, can't, they don't realize it at the moment. And the result, is that, or result of that is they live as though there was no danger at all, as if it was just them here. There's no upcoming judgment. There's no right and wrong. There's no God trying to save me. What's the end going to be? Death. Also, lost involves going astray or wandered away. Peter did say you were as sheep going astray in Second Peter 2.25. He did say that. As we saw earlier, men desire to walk in their own ways. The point is, being lost means you're not only departed from God, but that the distance between you and God is constantly increasing. You had gone astray, meaning you're on the move. The problem is that the direction you were going was not leading you to God. Rather, it's leading you further and further away from him, which would put you in a more and more dangerous state. The sheep in Luke 15 had wa it wandered away. The coin had been separated from the other coins, and the prodigal son packed his bags and left and wasted his substance with righteous living. The point being, you went astray. You needed to be found. Also, we can bring that there's no leader to lead them to the right way. I'm reminded of what the Gospel of Matthew said about Christ, how Christ viewed the crowds. It says that he was moved with compassion on them because they fainted and were scattered abroad as sheep having no shepherd. Scattered abroad <laughs> tells you a lot. That's not like a group going in a different direction, but it's like one here, one there, one there, and they're all going in different directions. No one knows where they're going. This is how Jesus viewed the crowds, which shows us more of what's involved with being lost. It means you have no leader, no one to direct you down the right path. Those who are saved have to be led. In Christ, you know, he is called the captain of our salvation. But at this point, when you're lost, you are without Christ, as it states in Colossians 2.12. Meaning, you had no leader or guide. Men are lost when they have no one to guide or lead them in the ways of righteousness. Lost means you're in darkness. Jesus brought this truth out in John 12.35. Yet a little, let's see, less darkness come upon you. For he that walketh in darkness knoweth not where he goeth. Uh -huh. Not knowing where you're going is a perfect description of being lost. Uh -huh. Not only are those in the dark not knowing where they're going due to blindness, they're constantly stumbling. There's no sense of direction. They have no way of detecting traps or snares that may await them. They have no way of escape when danger has come upon them. They're easily overcome. Those in the dark don't know where they're going. That's, those are the ones that get taken out easily. And let's also remember that being lost is associated with spiritual deadness, just deadness itself. I'm sure you've heard the word used this way. Perhaps someone died, someone close to someone died, and they said, we lost them. Well, you can use the word lost in this sense, too. You were dead. He did, and the prodigal son's father did say that. My son was dead. 
he was dead. So lost can also mean perish. You indeed were dead before you were found, that is, spiritually dead to God. You were in a state where you had to be revived. Ephesians 2, two times speaks, you were, you were dead in sins. You were quickened out of the state, but you were dead. Which shows that being lost means you're defeated, overcome, beaten, no hope of victory. And like after all going through all this, being lost means you're dependent on someone else to save you. Some, someone needs to redirect you, enlighten you, inform you, help you, lead you, revive you. That needs to happen when you're lost. Romans 5, 6 says, speak when uh, we were yet without strength, Christ died for the ungodly. You needed assistance of some kind. You need, someone needed to bring you up. There was nothing you could do to get yourself out of the state that you were in. If you were going to be saved, someone had to step in. And someone did, praise the Lord. That person was Christ Jesus, which gets us down to the, the really good stuff here. What's it mean to be found? Let's look at that. Well, being found is associated with safety. Because when you're found, you're brought somewhere. If you look at the parable of the prodigal son, the father of the, of the son had a celebration when his son returned. His older brother heard something going on, asked what had happened. His servant replied by saying that his brother had come back and he'd been rece received safe and sound. That's what he said of his brother. He's safe. He's with us now. He was no longer away from them and in an unsafe place in the world, wasting his substance. Likewise, those who are in Christ are now in a place of safety. When you heard you were found, it means you've been rescued, you could say. You may think of a man who's like stranded, stranded on an island. A ship, you, yeah. He sees a sheep, come pick him up. Oh, that must look good. Or you're in the quicksand, someone tosses you a rope. You're drowning, someone jumps in and swim, and like takes you to the shore. Uh -huh. You were in a spot of danger, but when someone spots you, they retrieve you from that spot. And, take, and they, they take you to safety. In the scripture, we read of people being snatched out of the fire yeah. quickly. Now, when snatched out of the fire, it's not like slow motion. Like when we snatch things out of the fire, it's like, like that. But then you think of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, and the fourth man's right there in the fire, and he's not getting burned, and it doesn't hurt him at all. Amen. He can bring you out without the smell of smoke on your clothes. Mm -hmm. Now, you were perishing... You, who were taking a safe place, Christ sp spoke of those who have been given to him this way. John 10, 28 through 29 says, I give unto them, that's us, eternal life, and they shall never perish, neither shall any man pluck them out of my hand. My Father which gave them me is greater than all, and no man is able to pluck them out of my Father's hand. Amen. Two hands, my hand and the Father's hand. No one, can, no one can remove you from that. Which gives you a good picture of the safety that you have in Christ. And those who have been, are found, they're safe. And we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Safety and peace. In Romans 5.1, those therefore being justified by faith, you have peace with God through Jesus Christ your Lord. That's the word of God right there. The place we've been taken to is a place you're welcome in. Just like the prodigal son, he was welcomed back. They had a celebration for him. There's peace in that place that he came to. Likewise, there's peace for you where you have been, been taken. No one who is in Christ is unsafe or not at peace with him. That's the result of being found. Now, here's an interesting thing to bring up. It's coming to your right mind. This is involved in being found. And one thing about the prodigal son reading that parable, something really stuck out. When you consider this aspect of being found, the prodigal son says he came to himself when he was feeding the swine. He was in a state where the husks that the pigs ate started to look good to him. Yeah. And it says he came to himself, which shows that he had either lost his mind or at least was on the verge of it. I mean, I mean, think about it. Pig's food. Think of what pigs eat. Pig's food. That starts looking good to you. I'd say if you're going to look at that, that disgusting slush and think, oh, I want some of that, you're probably insane. I'd say you probably lost your mind. Because when people, when people are losing their mind, they, they, they start seeing all kinds of strange things. You might think like rock turns into a hamburger or something like that because you're just so desperate. He had lost his mind, but he came to himself, snapped out of it. He was able to come to the right conclusions. He was able to see the things right and depart from where he was. 
This is what's said concerning a spiritual mind. To be carnally mind, carnally mind is, minded is death, but to be spiritually minded is life right. and peace. Amen. Obviously, those who have been found have come to themselves. They did not come to the right mind by their own means alone. There was a point when you saw you were wrong and repented, but what caused you to do that? You're like, you came to yourself. You were able to snap out of it. You were able to see. Like, well, what, what was his response when he came to himself? I've sinned. I must go back. My servants, they have, they, have better, they have a better life than I do. Mm-hmm. Look at me eating with these pigs and my father's servants, the low. Even his brother had servants. I must be, he said, I'm not worthy to be this man's son. I must go back and at least be a servant. I'll have a better life than this. But he came to him, but it's something he had to snap out of it. Came to his right mind. And the fact that you have come to yourself, the fact that you snapped out of it, is evidence you were found. Because some, some, the Lord caused you to do that. Which brings us to this next point, that those who are found, they've been drawn. Yep. Jesus said, no man comes to him unless the Father first drew him, in John 6, 44. And he made a similar expression to his disciples later in the same chapter, saying, therefore I say unto you, no man can come unto me except to were given unto him by my Father. That's John six sixty five. And when he said this, it was at that point, many of his disciples, they stopped following him. They left. But the twelve didn't. In relation to our main subject, the fact that you've been drawn shows that you've been found. The reason we came to Christ is because the Lord was at work. Several times you read of the Lord, how he called us. Like just to give a few reverence, like Romans 8.30, uh, Galatians 1.6, Thess- 2 Thessalonians 2.14, 2 Timothy 1.9. He's all mentioned, the Lord, he called you. Which shows us the means, a means by which he draws us. We may not see this at first, but... Once we're in, we're able to look back and see that the Lord was working in us coming to Christ. Something drew us to Jesus. The Lord called. Well, you might think of David, he's in that dry and thirsty land where no water is. And then maybe you hear the sound of a waterfall. Oh, you'll be run into that spot real quick, I imagine. And once, like, the th- when, like when Christ is being expounded, you hear him being opened up. You're in, that, you're in that dry spot. You're, in that, you're, around, you're with the pigs and you hear, you hear the sound of that. That draws you to Jesus. That's the Lord. He draws you to the source of life. Amen. Those who are lost do not know where to go, but those who have been found, they've been drawn into the place that they are at. Being found means you're in the light. The Word of God affirms this to be the case that you were, you were all, you're all the children of light. In 1 Thessalonians 5.5, 5, And the children of the day, you are not of the night, nor of the darkness. That's not what you are. For, and also Ephesians 5, but again, says, You were sometimes dark, but now you're light in the Lord. Walk as children of light. 1 Peter 2, 9. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and a holy nation, a peculiar people, that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his, I really like the way this is stated, his marvelous light. So found means you're on the inside. It means that things are clear to you. You can see. See? You, um, seeing that God Himself is light, you could you're like God now. Like this, this could be related to enlightenment. Like the lights come on, you could see things the way they are. You could see, all right, this is not the right place. I know where I need to be. I know where I'm supposed to be going. I could see which path is correct. I know the voice of the one who's leading me. No one's going to lead me the wrong way. This is involved in coming into the light, which is a result of being found. Amen. Also, you're alive. Let's not forget that found means you're alive, Amen. alive and well. In Scripture, we're told to reckon ourselves dead to sin, alive to God, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Romans 6.11 also told that in Christ, all are made alive. That's 1 Corinthians 15.22. In the Gospel of John, we're told that those who believe in Christ, they have everlasting life. That's in the present tense. In John 5.24, he who believes he has, it, he has it now, meaning you have it right then. In the parable of the prodigal son, the father made it known that he was no longer dead. He's alive again. In Luke 15, 32, that's what he said about his son. We're also said to be quickened. And that's like a quick process, like sprung to life. Mm-hmm. Like you're in a man, but then you're sprung on your feet. Animate, you're moving again. The result of being found is being raised out of deadness and sins. And kind of like a similar ending to what was lost, you obtained assistance from another. As stated, as stated earlier. I can once again bring to your attention the passage that says Christ died for us when we were without strength. That's Romans 5, 6. But I want to bring this truth out a little more with one of Christ's parables, that being the parable of the Good Samaritan. In this parable, a man was going to Jericho when thieves attacked him and they left him half dead. 
means he's going to die soon if someone doesn't help him. Just barely alive, beaten within an inch of his life. They just left him to perish. A priest passes by and a Levite does the same. But then a good Samaritan comes and finds him beaten and dying. And this is what's said at that point. But the Samaritan, as he journeyed, came where he was and he saw him and he had compassion on him. And he went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring in oil and wine, and set him on his own beast and brought him to an inn and took care of him. Well, that's a lot, isn't it? He did this and this and this. That's similar to that shepherd going out and getting that sheep and bringing him back. Or that woman sweeping the floor, zealously trying to find that coin. So the, the work is not traced back to us. We were in a helpless state. That's the point. You were like this man. You're dying on the road. You're not going anywhere. At best, all you're going to do is die quicker if you wait. But you were found and recovered. Someone came, took you up. He took you back. Amen. When you could not do that yourself. Amen. So again, the, the salvation that we have is traced back to the Lord working on our behalf. But then we read about this joy that's in heaven when a sinner repents. What happens when one sinner repents? The shepherd brought back one lost sheep. And this was a cause for rejoicing. A great cause for it. The woman found her silver coin, her one coin that she lost. And she calls friends together, come rejoice with me. This is a happy occasion. And the prodigal son, his father's one son that was lost, came back. And he kills the fatted calf and has a feast of celebration when his son had returned. Jesus said there's joy in heaven over one sinner that repents. Just over one. Now if there's joy in heaven for one sinner that repents, then you must reason that there's a lot of rejoicing in heaven. Seeing all of the millions and thousands that have repented at the at hearing of Jesus. The Father is glad when men come to him. Christ happy and glad when sinners come. And the heavenly hosts rejoice with them. Christ does indeed take pleasure in saving what was lost. And Christ, he, you know, he receives those who come. Just as his Father did receive his Son. He came back, he embraced him. Jesus said, come to me, all ye who he or that labor and are heavy laden. I will give you rest. Come. Come. Arms open. In John 7, 37, if any man thirsts, let him come to me and drink. He has something to offer those people. I will fill your bellies. A person coming to Christ is no small matter. It's clear that a sinner coming is a cause for great rejoicing and gladness. This is what the Pharisees overlooked while they were murmuring about Christ receiving sinners. They were like the older brother of the prodigal son who apparently had never broken any rules. He did everything his father said, always worked and stayed by his father's side, and yet his father didn't even give him a young goat to enjoy with his friends. How dare he give this foolish man who'd gone out and wasted his substance on harlots, and he kills the fatted calf for him. This just seems so unreasonable at the moment, seeing that he'd never himself done anything wrong. However, this older brother had overlooked what happened. His brother was lost, but he was found again. He was dead, but now he's alive again. Likewise, the Pharisees complain when they should have been rejoicing. Let us not also cease to rejoice when we see sinners, those who are lost, being found. Christ has received them, but we should not neglect to do so ourselves. Right. In Jesus' parable, when the father saw his son afar off, he ran to him, embraced him. He fell on his neck and kissed him. So happy to see him back in safe and sound in one piece. Likewise, Christ will not reject those who come to him. He made this known to us. All that the Father giveth me shall come to me, and him that cometh to me I will no wise cast out. Mm -hmm. Amen. I will not reject anyone who wants what I have to offer. Mm -hmm. Well, Jesus even said, like those who come to him, that, that those who love him, I, Father, will love him. I will love him. We're going to make our home in him. Mm -hmm. You're welcome with, when you come to Jesus. And you've witnessed this yourself. There's a point when you came to Jesus and he embraced you. Surely you can remember this. You can, you can testify of this text. Jesus took you in. He did not reject you. And he, there was great rejoicing when you came in. He happily received you. He manifested himself to you, made his home in you. And it's good to know that when you came in, the heavens were rejoicing at your interest. What a joy there is in Christ Jesus. Now, in conclusion of this, I'm going to give you exhortations. Seeing that you were saved, you're no longer in that status of lost. You'd best see to it that you don't fall into that state again. Since you have come into Christ, your adversary, the devil, 
is more than zealous to draw you back into that darkness that you were once in. Very zealous, aggressive. And we are warned about being spoiled in Colossians 2.8. Beware lest any man spoil you through philosophy and vain deceit after the tradition of men, after the rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. That's said to people that are found. That's who he said that to. In this, it's possible for someone, is that possible for someone to be lost again? I can't, I can't see how you can be spoiled in the sense of everything being taken from you and you still be found. I can't see that, how that would fit. It'd be like them dragging you back into that state that you were once in. So I urge you to beware of lies and deceit. You're in the light. Please stay in that light. Second Peter 3.17 Ye therefore, brethren, seeing you know these things before, beware lest ye be led away with the error of the wicked. Amen. You know these things, he said. You know this. But he still says beware. Amen. Fall, it says, being led away from the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Becoming lost again would be likened to falling away. I don't, like falling away in that, in the scripture when I read that phrase, I'm not thinking about a, like just taking a step back, I'm thinking falling off the cliff. That's what comes to mind when I read that. There's a point where you can be cut off, lost used in the sense of perish, is, you know, like maybe in this text, as controversial as it may be, I'll just share it, just not so much to like uh, discourage, but to like get, just show you the urgency of the situation. It says, For it's impossible for those who've been once enlightened and tasted the heavenly gift and were made partakers of the Holy Ghost and have tasted the good word of God and the powers of the world to come if they shall fall away to renew them again to repentance, seeing they crucified to themselves the Son of God afresh and put them in open shame. People who have renounced Christ are in a deadly state indeed. The passage is obviously speaking of an in irreconcilable state, thus it says the word impossible. If a person is in this state, they cannot come back. Who it is that it's in this state, we don't know. But you can see to it, you don't fall into that state yourself. Amen. You can see to it that God will never have to say of you, it's impossible to renew him again to repentance. You can, you can see to it. God has made provision for you never to have that said about you. Amen. Do not let these things cause you like to trouble you, but use them as exhortations yeah. to know the seriousness of the situation so that you will know to take what you have seriously. Do not entertain fleshly lusts that, and passions that lead you away from Christ uh -huh. and cause you to lo not love or consider him. Stay the course, brethren. Mm -hmm. John 15, 2 says, Every man's branch that's in me that beareth not fruit is taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purged that they may not that may bring forth much more fruit. So obviously bearing fruit's not automatic. Something you have to do. They, sometimes people view like the vine and the branches like a factory. It's just like everything runs like a machine. Well, guess what? Things can go wrong in a factory. So likewise, you know, don't look at it as automatic. Use the provisions that the true vine has given you and just keep working. Keep pleasing the Father. If you don't maintain what you have through Christ's provision, you get cut off. Cast in the fire. That's lost. All right, that's lost again. So exhortation at this point, in conclusion, be strong in the Lord, like the scriptures say. Here's some scriptures that really bring this out. Ephesians 6.10, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. That's a word to found someone who's found. Colossians 1.23, Continue in the faith, grounded and settled, and be not moved away from the hope of a gospel which you have heard. Colossians 2, 6, and 7, As ye have therefore received Christ Jesus the Lord, so walk ye in him, rooted and built up in him, and established in the faith that ye, as ye have been taught, abounding therein with thanksgiving. And lastly, Jude 1, 20 and 21, But ye, brethren, building up yourselves in the most holy faith, praying in the Holy Ghost, keep yourselves in the love of God, looking for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ unto eternal life. I also exhort you to make your calling election sure. God told us if you do these things, you will never fall. Amen. Never fall. Amen. And he means what he said. That's 1 Peter 1.20. Amen. Brethren, you were lost, but now you are found. Amen. You were a sheep going astray, but now you've returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. Amen. You have been brought back to the flock. You've been drawn out of darkness and into God's marvelous light. You've been snatched out of the fire. You've been enlightened and no longer ignorant. You've been raised out of deadness. You've been no longer wandering with no leader to lead you. And it's because of what the Lord has done. 
the shepherd went back and got the sheep. That's traced back to the shepherd. That's like Christ, he came into the world and he saved you and he brought you back with him. The woman, she lost her coin, she swept. Well, what's sweeping? That's cleaning. He has to make a path where you can see the coin. Then he can retrieve it. He opened up, made a way for you to come in so he can come to you. Likewise, the prodigal son, that the father drew you to him. He caused you to come to yourself. He, he, he caused you to be pricked in your conscience and see things the way that they were, and you were able to repent, throw down these, these sinful things that you were involved in, and come to Christ. Amen. All of it is traced back to the Father. Amen. So with that said, I say, do not let the wicked one rob you of these things that you have. Amen. Amen.